Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning, Charles. Hey, Merry Christmas. Yay. Yeah, happy birthday, Jesus, right? Yeah, let's celebrate Jesus' birthday. It's uh, amazing. Yeah, this time of year is such a, a, a beautiful time, right? We've got all the lights and the decorations and, and all the excitement of the gifts and presents and stuff. We've got a fire now going over here. You know, figure we'd make it a little bit warmer in here. Uh, anyway, even um, if, you, if you know the calendar, Friday was the shortest day of the year. It was actually the darkest day of the year. But actually yesterday was brighter. Yep. Had more sunlight. And today had even more sunlight. So we're on the ascent, right? <laughs> more and more sunshine every day since the winter solstice. So uh, it's uh, now that those of us who really like the sunshine uh, get more and more hopeful, right? Because <laughs> they're getting more and more light each day. Well, uh, along with the, the Christmas fun, I figured a, a few years ago I did um, this riddle of uh, Christmas carols. Yeah, so let's see if you can guess these Christmas carols. Now, last time we gave you clues. Right. This time the clues are going to be the opposites. So we'll see if you can figure out which Christmas carols they are. So the first one, what is Big Tuba Man? What Christmas carol is that? It's the opposite. Big what? Big Tuba Man. Boy. So instead of big... It's little. Little drummer boy. Little drummer boy. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Well, how about this one? Noisy day. Oh, that was too easy. Too easy. <laughs> okay. How about Tinkerbell is leaving the city? Santa Claus is coming. Oh, Santa Claus. Not Tinkerbell. Santa Claus is coming to town. Okay, good. Well, how about what adult was that? Yeah, I, I, I kind of hear it. What is it? Whose child is this? Close. <laughs> what child is this, right? Child. What child is this? We know whose child it is. It's God's child, right? <laughs> How about Satan work us sad ladies? <laughs> so the opposite of Satan would be God. The opposite of work is play. Rest. God rest, you, you merry gentlemen. <laughs> okay, good. Okay, one last one. Grief from the stars. Blessing from the earth. Close. Christmas Carol. Oh, holy night. Close. Blessings from heaven. No. Grief. What's the opposite of grief? Happy. Happy. Another word for happy. The opposite of grief is joy. 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 joy to the world. Grief from the stars, joy to the world. Okay, you guys get a B plus on that one. <laughs> Good job. Good job. Anyway, it's all about Jesus, right? Let, you know, we have lots of fun things that are happening. It's an exciting time of year. Um, and it's a really wonderful time of year, but we always want to remember the root, the reason for the season, right, is Jesus Christ, the coming of Jesus 2,000 years ago. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about the value of Jesus. You know, this celebration, it's happening all around the world, and there's decorations and lights, and so much is going on, and there's so much that we're celebrating, and yet, and yet sometimes it's easy to forget what this... What the birthday of Jesus, the significance of Christmas was for God. The incredible value for God. Now, last, um, uh, this is from Father Moon. He said, the person who came is the original being. The one center and being of hope is Jesus Christ. God suffered for 4,000 years until he sent Jesus Christ. Now, if you remember, the last time I talked about all the history of God's providence that went in to finally the day that Jesus could come. You know, it wasn't just, oh, God decided, well, I'm in a good mood, I'm going to send the Messiah today. No, it was, uh, it was part of the, a long providential history. And we went through that, you know, this biblical years. There's 2,000 biblical years from Adam and Eve through Noah until the coming of Abraham. And then through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that's the beginning of 
the chosen people of Israel, the Israelites, the Jewish people. So that's 2,000 biblical. We know that there's a lot more years involved there. I mean, how much pain is that for God until finally he has a chosen people that he can claim through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But then the chosen people went to Egypt and suffered 400 years of slavery in Egypt, right? And then there was 400 years of the judges where they were traveling around. They didn't really have a king. And then after those 400 years, we have the United Kingdom, starting with Saul, and then King David, and then King Solomon. And that was an amazing time for God. You know, it was the, the pinnacle of Jewish power in the, the kingdom of Israel. And yet, because of the faithlessness of the people at that time, then they went a difficult course. And then you have the divided kingdom. But 400 years, this is all biblical in, in the Bible, where the kingdoms are divided. This is the time of a lot of the great prophets who went up, uh, Elijah and Isaiah and, and like that, trying to get people to repent. Finally, after all that, they fail, and, and prophet Jeremiah prophesies they spend 70 years in Babylon under captivity. And then there's another 140 years, a total of 210 years, where they're taken away into Babylonian captivity and return, and finally restore the temple, build the temple in, in Jerusalem. And now there's another 400 years where God's preparing the world for Jesus to come. So the fruit of this 6,000, this 4,000 biblical years is what we're celebrating day after tomorrow. is what we're celebrating in Christmas. This, all this, all this effort that God made till finally he had the condition where the people were faithful, the world was prepared so he could send the Messiah. The, the wonderful thing about studying this, and I encourage you, if you have a chance, you know, when you're studying divine principle, uh, look at the parallels between what happened in Jewish history compared with Christian history and the coming of our true parents. So it's, it's quite, quite exciting. I want to read this from uh, Mother Moon. Uh, this is in 2002. Uh, she spoke at the United Nations. It was an assembly of the Interreligious and International uh, Federation for World Peace. That, that was the forerunner organization of what we uh, call now the Universal Peace Federation. And actually, it's from this book of, of many regions. If you don't have this, I highly recommend it. Uh, there's, there's a series of four in this. But uh, this is from this particular talk. The talk was, the United Nations is an organization that should realize God's ideal. God exists. After creating the world, God did not abandon it and go elsewhere. Just like any parent, God also feels despair when his children are in pain. God's great misery is from the loss of humankind's ability to feel his heart. Because of this, we are unaware that God is our parent, that all people are God's children, and that we are all brothers and sisters. The amazing thing of, that we're celebrating in Christmas is finally God has an original true human being. He comes as the true Adam. Whereas Adam and Adam and Eve fell in the garden, Jesus comes as the second Adam, as the Adam who can fulfill all that potential that God longed to see in Adam and also in Eve. Uh, in the Bible it says, uh, Jesus says, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Jesus was one in heart and mind with God. So I want to go through and reflect a little bit about the divine principle chapter called Christology and really how it applies to us, understanding the nature of this amazing person who was born 2,000 years ago and that we're celebrating in our Christmas celebrations. So this is from the exposition of the divine principle uh, in the section on Christology. There is no greater value than that of a person who has realized the ideal of creation. This is the value of Jesus, who surely attained the highest imaginable value. The conventional Christian belief in Jesus' divinity is well-founded because as a perfect human being, Jesus is totally one with God. In fact, the principle of creation elevates the true value of all people who fulfill the purpose of creation to a level comparable with Jesus.
to Jesus. Jesus broke through and made the foundation as a true human being. Finally, God has a true son, someone who knows him, who's one with him in heart on earth. This is the value that actually all of us were meant to have, to be little Jesuses, you know, that we could also be one in heart and mind with God, that we are people who fulfill the potential uh, and the, all the purpose of our creation. Jesus is the first true human being in human history. It's such a profound thing to understand and to appreciate. So let's look at the value of, of a person who fulfills God's purpose of creation. So again, from the divine principle, this section outlines three key values, divine, unique, and cosmic value. So first, Jesus and anyone who fulfills God's purpose of creation, ideal, is a person of divine value. Here's what it says in the divine principle. Just as there is an inseparable oneness between the mind and body of a true person centered on God, there is inseparable oneness between God and a true person. A true person experiences the heart of God as his own reality. Such a person is the temple of God in whom God can dwell continually and come to possess a divine nature. This is the design that God had for all of us, that we would have divine value, that we'd be inseparably one, united with God as our heavenly parent. Jesus is the one who comes first, who's one in heart and mind with God. You know, how comforting for God, right? God, the God of, of broken heart, who, whose heart was broken when Adam and Eve, when his children fell away. And when we look at all the, the biblical history of how many times the chosen people, he blessed them, he prepared them, and then they went off again and again. And God's painful heart, like a painful heart of a parent who loves the children so much, and yet sees them continually causing suffering and suffering themselves. So Jesus comes what a thing to celebrate, right? Jesus as the man who's here that is inseparably united with God. One in heart and mind with God. What joy God must have felt. I love it when we sing, you know, joy to the world, right? The Savior's come. How joyful is it for God to have this being who's inseparable in heart and oneness with God. So then, not only is divine value, but the Jesus and a person who fulfills God's purpose is a person of unique value. This, here's what it says in the divine principle. God created human beings for the purpose of sharing joy with them. Every human being possesses a unique individual character. No matter how many billions of people are born on the earth, no two will have exactly the same personality. Hence, that person is the only one in the entire universe who can stimulate that distinctive aspect of God's nature to bring him joy. Every person who has completed the purpose of creation is thus a unique existence in the cosmos. What a thing to understand is that every person has incredible precious value is unique, irreplaceable, and that each one of us can bring a unique joy, special joy to God. That without us, God can't feel that particular joy. Every person that's not disconnected from God, that's, that's an aspect of joy that God wants to feel so much that is lost to God. So no one can replace any one of us ever in the eyes of God, in the heart of God, and the contribution, the difference that each one of us can make in the world is unique to each one of us. You know, sometimes you think, oh, you know, someone else will take care of it, or, or they'll do it, or, oh, what does it matter if I do it or I don't do it, right? It does matter. Each one of us makes an incredible difference. And to understand 
the principal's perspective, God's perspective on each one of us, that we have a unique value that is unique and distinct, that can bring joy to God especially, but also be a blessing to the world. So how precious was it for God when Jesus was born, you know, 2,000 years ago, for the, for the lonely heart of God, right? The God who longs to have that loving relationship with a child who has divine value, who understands God, who's one in heart and mind with God, but is unique and have a special, profound relationship of joy and fellowship with God. What an amazing thing we're celebrating when we celebrate Christmas. We're celebrating God's lonely heart, finally being comforted by someone on earth who knows his heart and can bring God joy. How precious, how amazing is that? But that's also the hope that God has for each one of us. That we can be those, those people who bring joy and comfort to God's heart. And then the third thing the divine principle emphasizes is cosmic value. Here's, here's from the principle. A person who's completed the purpose of creation can govern the entire universe. Possessing both spirit and flesh, he can rule the spirit world with his spirit self and the physical world with his physical self. It's amazing. God designed us to be beings of cosmic value, a microcosm. Each one of us represents a microcosm of the universe, of the physical world and the spiritual world. And we're designed to have dominion over all things in creation. Dominion in the world. A dominion of true love. This is God's hope. And how hopeful was God when Jesus was born, when Jesus came. How hopeful for God who'd been suffering all of history since, the, since Adam and Eve fell. God has been suffering and grieving. And finally, Jesus comes as a person of divine value, of unique value, and cosmic value who can end the suffering heart. How hopeful was it for God that at this time in history, the breakthrough can happen and the healing of his heart can happen because he has a true son on earth. How precious is that? How amazing that we are designed to be people who have that kind of dominion of, over the spiritual world and the physical world. That we're divine beings, one in heart and mind with God. That we're unique have our unique expression and that we can have this kind of dominion of love representing God in the world. So, the value of a person who's fulfilled God's purpose of creation, we see this very first in all of human history in Jesus Christ. You know, a person of divine value, of unique value, and cosmic value. Unique, <clears throat> divine in the person who can comfort God's heart, who's one in heart and mind with God. Unique value to, to end God's loneliness as that special person, unique person, who can bring joy to God in that special, unique way. And to give hope to end the suffering of God and the suffering of, of humankind in all of history. So, the bottom line comes back to us, right? <laughs> I want to kind of finish up with... so. How do we accomplish the purpose of creation? Remember the three great purposes to become a person of true love. That's our first goal. To become enlightened. To use uh, other language. To become a person who's one in heart and mind with God. Who's enlightened. And a person who loves others. Can multiply that love horizontally with people in the world around us. And people who have dominion over all the things in the creation. So we're coming to the end of the year. You know, the, the time to, uh, Christmas time is a good time to bring joy, the hopefulness of this time, but also looking forward to the new year. So when we make determinations, when we do reflections about you know, what's my goals for the next year, it's good to look at these three great blessings, right? The first one to become a person of true love. And we do that through loving God, through our relationship with God, our Heavenly Parent. And we grow in that by bringing God, attending God, by living in the presence of God at all times. So when we're celebrating Christmas, when we're you know, having friends over, when we're sharing a meal, when we're watching a movie, when we're playing games, when we're doing things, always invite God to be with us. 
Invite God's presence. So that God can enjoy all the, the joy and the celebrations that we're having now. Don't just think about God when I'm in trouble. Oh, things are so bad. God, help me. <laughs> right? No, how about, oh, things are so great. God, thank you. Come have fun with me. <laughs> right? That's just what God wants. He wants to have joy with us. So becoming a true loving person means becoming that, having that divine value, one in heart and mind with God. And we're growing in our ability to reflect God's nature to other people. And we do that by investing. It doesn't happen automatically. I you know, wish it did. At least it doesn't for me. It means we study. We seek to understand God's heart. That's why we, it's important that we have a regular practice of studying scripture, you know, our, our, our tradition. Hunduke, the Korean word for gathering and studying. You know, daily, studying, reading God's word, and nourishing our spirit, feeding our spirit, so that we're growing and we're understanding in our relationship with God. Spending quality time in prayer with God, a quiet time where we can share and commune with God. Make that connection even deeper and deeper. And also putting that into practice, being people who act as God's representative in the world when the things that we do. <clears throat> That's our first purpose, is become a divine person, an individual person who knows God and expresses God in the world. Jesus said the first great commandment is love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your being. Right? And then our second great purpose, Jesus tells us, is the second great commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. That means to create, to, be, you know, to love our family, to love our community, to create a true loving family, and ultimately, a true loving world. It means investing in others, a loving relationship with others. Especially at Christmas time, it's a good time to think about what can we do for the benefit of others? How can we make a positive difference? And also, how can we connect with other people? Fellowship. Fellowship and spending time together with others for mutual support. And also, to multiply goodness. Hey, if I'm having a great experience, I'm having a fantastic turkey dinner that I prepared with all this fancy relish and side dishes and all kinds of stuff. How much am I going to enjoy that if I'm just sitting there by myself eating it? Oh yeah, this tastes good. But you know, if I have friends over, if I have people together and I'm sharing that, how much more joy can I have? Hey, try this. Did you try this? Did you try the, the stuffing? Did you try the pumpkin pie? Did you try all these things, right? How much more joy can we have when we're sharing it? It multiplies love. We're not meant to be solitary beings. We're designed to be in relationship. And of course, the beginning place is in our family. So we have time where we gather together. So we have family. We fellowship. We have fun and invite God to be present in that fellowship, in that time together. And we multiply goodness. Also, we're supporting each other. Bringing joy, helping each other to experience joy. Especially sometimes in this time of year, you know, it can be uh, depressing, especially with family not around. You know, people are alone. There's so many opportunities for us to multiply God's blessing to the people around us. That's the second great purpose we have in life, is loving relationships with the people around us. First, our connection with God, and second, our connection with the people around us. And then the third great purpose is our dominion over the things of creation. You know, but having a dominion of true love. Father Moon likes to use the expression being an owner, an owner of true love, someone who cares about things and doesn't abuse, abuse or misuse our, the physical world and our creation. Of course, that means we, we care for nature and creation, but also we use our benefits, our gifts, for the benefit of others, to make a positive difference in the world. Uh, dominion of the physical world, of course, that's money, that means we use our money for heavenly purposes. You know, tithing is a fundamental thing, you know, giving 10%. But using our money, using our resources, using the many blessings we have to multiply that and sharing that with others. Having a dominion over true, of true love means we genuinely care for and invest in the things of nature, the things of the material world. And that we do it with love not motivated or, or controlled by our selfish desires. Oh, more for me, more for me. Well, honestly speaking, more for me means more I can give to others. Uh -huh. 
Sometimes we miss that second step. I want to be really successful. I want to be really rich. I want to be very successful. Why? Because then I can do more for others, right? If I'm poor and small and weak and not so many skills, uh, you know, I try to help others, but I, my tank is kind of empty and I don't have so much to give. So God wants us to prosper. God wants us to do well because then he knows that people of true love, we're going to multiply that. The more prosperous we are, the more the world is going to benefit. The more knowledge we have, the more skills we have, the more we develop ourselves and, and our dominion over the world around us, the more we can make a positive influence in the environment and the world around us. So, accomplishing the purpose of creation, becoming a true love person, creating true love in our family and in the world around us, and having a dominion, our relationship with the things of creation, being owners who love with true love, true love owners. This is who we are designed to be. Now, I'm not there. I hope a few of you are, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm still working on it. And, but having this vision, understanding that the value that God sees in each one of us, that, that is reflected in the celebration we have of Christmas time, of Jesus Christ who came and manifested in concrete fashion, these ideals of, of a divine value, someone who knows one heart and mind with God, who can actually comfort God's heart. Jesus Christ is a unique human being, distinct from anyone else, who can bring that unique special joy to God and make that unique difference in the world. And Jesus was cosmic value, who can represent God in his relationship with all things in the creation and all things in the world. That's what we are all called to be. We, that's what we all have. That's all our potential. Divine beings. Unique. Amazing. Unique. Right? Hi, you, you guys are so unique. <laughs> when I look out here, it's like, wow, look, we're in all sizes, shapes, and colors, and, and, and everything, right? Ages and everything. It's so wonderful. It's so amazing. And the value that we have as owners of true love, cosmic value for the universe. So let me close with this uh, uh, word from Father Moon. You may not have much to be proud of, but God should be able to say that you are a true family member of Jesus. That is, you should be able to become a person with whom God can live forever and whom God, Jesus, and even you can approve of a heavenly family member who can manifest the glory of God. Such a person for whom God has been looking, for whom Christ has been looking, and for whom you hope to become. Let's become those people, and let's celebrate this Christmas time. Please join me in prayer. Father, Mother, God, our, our loving Heavenly Parent, your precious love, your 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 fatherly love for us and your motherly comforting love for us. We're so grateful for the, your presence in our lives. And at this time of the year when uh, the dark of the Christmas, the winter season, the most bright light in human history, Jesus Christ was born and the celebration that we're, we're having now. We pray you can find joy in all our celebrations, that we can deeply appreciate the significance of your son, Jesus Christ, who came 2,000 years ago with so much hope and so much light for this time in history. Heavenly Parent, we are so grateful for your precious love, and especially, Heavenly Parent, for the confidence that you have in us. Heavenly Parent, we repent that oftentimes we don't see ourselves from your perspective and, and we forget the kind of value that you see in each one of us, divine, unique, and cosmic value. And sometimes we feel ourselves to be worthless and, and not worth it. Heavenly Parent, please continue to guide us. Help us to grow in our, our ability to understand your love and our relationship with you. Help us to be people who are loving and in relationship with the people around us so that we can know your love and we can express your love. And especially as a parent as we deal with the, the material world and things of our possessions, that they can all be things that we use to multiply your joy, your goodness, and your love in this world. Father, Mother, God, our Heavenly Parent, thank you. Thank you so much for your constant presence. And we offer up ourselves again in celebration of Jesus Christ coming 2,000 years ago this Christmas season to you. 
So together as your sons and daughters, as blessed sense families, we all offer this together. Amen and adieu.